In this module, we will set the stage for the rest of the course. We'll cover the history of how the PCA market formed, a description of what a PCA is, and discuss some of the differences between PCAs performed for various reasons. To know the underlying forces behind this work, we will discuss the users and drivers of this process and how the work varies by property type. Lastly, we'll touch on levels and scopes. Note that subsequent modules will go into much more detail. If you haven't yet read about the RTC and the CMBS industry, it would be worth your time to go back to the summary page and review some of the links offered. As the CMBS industry grew and physical due diligence became a routine part of the process, there was much need for standardization. In 1995, one of the rating agencies, Standard & Poor's, who was reviewing and rating these investments, issued a guide to help with standardization. However, even then, there was a fair amount of confusion as to what a PCA should entail and some uncertainty of the definitions to particular terms. ASTM stepped in in 1999 and, with the help of volunteers of the industry, offered the first version of the E-2018 standard. This did much to reduce confusion in the marketplace. Since 2000, there has been additional convergence in scope, methodology, and cost. There are fundamental reasons why PCAs are performed, besides the fact that they are part of the underwriting or CMBS process. First and foremost, properties fall apart, as any homeowner knows. They need to be maintained, and the larger the property and the investment, the more planning and more money is required. When not maintained, properties lose value, and for investments, this is a large problem. A standardized process can help owners, purchasers, lenders, and others understand the value and risk associated with a piece of commercial real estate from the physical side. Facility condition assessments have a different scope and may involve going down to the detail of assessing doorknobs. FCAs are often performed on institutional buildings such as colleges and schools. They should not be confused with PCAs. As mentioned above, over the last 20 years, a substantial number of PCAs have been done as part of the loan underwriting process. Lenders wanted to make sure that the cost to maintain a property would not put the loan at risk. This would be called debt side due diligence. Another significant reason for ordering a PCA would be for the situation where someone was purchasing a property and would want to know the major issues or costs they would incur before buying. They could use this information to negotiate the purchase price. This is called equity side due diligence. It is important to note that debt and equity PCAs vary dramatically in scope or detail and cost. These differences should be understood by the provider and the requester. Finally, PCAs can be done as part of financial or strategic planning by a current property owner. A detailed form of a PCA is called a facility condition assessment, as we referenced in the previous slide. Now that we have covered a little background, let's get into some detail. The purpose of the PCA is to identify physical deficiencies with the subject property. To systematically evaluate the deficiencies that may exist, a number of areas are evaluated. For the building site, drainage, retaining walls, and paving, curbing, and parking are evaluated. For the building envelope, the exterior walls and windows are examined. The structural foundation and framing is also considered. For interior elements, the units, rooms, common areas, and other interior features are examined. The roof is assessed, the HVAC system is reviewed, plumbing is examined, as well as electrical. If a building has elevators, escalators, or moving walkways, they are assessed. Lastly, a PCA professional may examine code compliance, life safety, accessibility, air quality, and some other considerations, however, some of these are outside the scope of ASTM 2018 standard.